Let's turn to counterterrorism expert David Gerenstein Ross, senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. He's also joining us on the phone is our law enforcement analyst and former FBI assistant director Tom Fuentes. Good to have you both with us. Tom, I'll start with you. Um, I think many people are wondering uh, why the city of Paris maybe isn't shutting down. I suppose it's not logistically possible, but it, it, it doesn't seem as though, uh, well, it does seem as though they're on high alert. We know that some, several systems have been put in place to secure the people. But talk about the challenges of shutting down a city such as Paris to conduct an investigation and search for gunmen that are on the loose. Well, you use all kinds of resources, you know, already trying to check every railroad station and airline that's leaving town and, uh, you know, every major roadway that people could be driving out of town. The fact that they switched cars. Uh, you know, that, I mean, that's standard procedure for garden variety bank robbers in this country. So that's mm. not sophisticated, but it does mean you don't know what vehicle they're in at the moment. You don't know if they're still heavily armed. Uh, possibly they've already abandoned the weapon somewhere, which can't be traced back to them. They were wearing masks, so we don't have a, a good facial description of what they look like. So you're really, you know, you're, uh, they'll do their standard procedures of trying to be very vigilant at the transport uh, areas, but beyond that, it's going to be really hard. But for the better effort, it's going to be than the plot itself. Uh, you know, going back through their signals, intelligence, social media, all all of that, and then in consultation with a variety of intel and law enforcement sources from around the world. Um, and again, this is not the first attack on that magazine. The previous one in. 2011, and it's certainly not the first terror plot in France or even in Paris specifically, going back to the major plot to blow up the U.S. Embassy in September of 2001. Uh, arrests were made. There were cells in seven European countries and in Dubai, and it got zero publicity in the U.S. because we had 9-11, which got all of the publicity, and, you know, deservedly so. But... That plot was, was thwarted the week of 9-11. Multiple people uh, were prosecuted in several countries and uh, went to prison for that plot. And uh, so Paris, Paris has had al-Qaeda. They've had uh, terror organizations from North Africa. They have a, a large Moroccan immigrant population, Algerian, who speak fluent French and Arabic both. Uh, and, and have been in Paris a long time, as well as uh, Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and, and then uh, now inspired ISIS terrorists. So, I mean, the, in this case, when you look at who are the usual suspects, there's almost too many usual suspects. But there's also, David, David, some things interesting about this attack that, that don't look like some of the attacks we've seen before. First of all, these men appeared, appeared to have some kind of military training. I mean, the shots were all grouped very close together. They were extremely calm during this entire operation, dressed head to toe in, in black, in, in, a, you know, in the, head, the, the covering over their heads almost as a uniform. And then they escaped in the car. And what Tom Fuentes says, switching cars is something that any criminal might do. But it's not part of a suicide attack. Escaping in one car and switching to another is not part of a suicide attack, and we have seen that before. What does this combination of things tell you? First of all, whether they had military training or not, uh, I think it's too early to say. Um, I, I think the shot groupings are indeed a relevant data point. They need to look into that and whether um, they had training, say, in, in Syria or whether they uh, simply you know, spent a lot of time on a range getting professionalized type training. Um, it's also possible that the shots aren't quite as professional as they're being made out to be. Often first reports end up being a little bit misleading. Uh, secondly, um, yes, this is a different kind of attack. Um, I, I suspect, look, we, we don't know what their next move is, whether they have a secondary target in mind. Uh, right now, I, I kind of suspect that this is an urban warfare style attack. We've seen that happen in a few cities. We saw it happen uh, in Mombasa, Kenya. We saw it happen in Mumbai, India, uh, where you have a small group of individuals that are able to wreak havoc over an extended period uh, by uh, basically moving through a city. Uh, they know that they've brought down the full weight of French law enforcement, intelligence, and counterterrorism upon them. So my suspicion would be that they have um, a secondary attack plan, but that's not necessarily the case. Obviously, in the U.S. very recently in Boston, you had the Boston attackers uh, try to carry out an attack and then make a clean getaway, which fortunately they weren't able to do. 
Our thanks to Tom Fuentes and David Gartenstein Ross. We thank you for your expertise. As we keep on saying, the three gunmen responsible for this attack still at large, on the loose, in Paris perhaps, or maybe beyond. This has not stopped the people in Paris from planning peaceful gatherings all over the city. They, of course, are using social media. The largest of these gatherings will take place next hour in the same district as the Charlie Hebdo office where the terror attack happened. 16,000 people have signed up to attend this event. We'll be right back.